That's great. So let me make a comment in the first place. Uh, so the introduction mentioned uh, discussion of open problems. This talk, not so much. Yeah. This talk will not be so much an open problems because I was asked to go over some old stuff. So some of you will benefit from this more than others. But anyway, that's the plan for the talk. So uh, I'm going to start by just talking about some of the basics of convexity and pseudo-convexity theory. Uh, suppose that in the early 20th century, we had a project of trying to build a complex analog of convexity theory. Now that's sort of what actually happened, but I don't think it's exactly what happened. I don't think that was actually the goal. But let's just pretend that that was our goal. Well, we could start by looking at the collection of convex open sets, but then since we're complex analysts, we think that maybe we should expand that a bit. So we could also throw in the sets which are biholomorphically equivalent to convex open sets. And then we could go a step further. If we're optimistic, we might think it might be useful to look at open sets that are locally uh, equivalent to convex open sets in a neighborhood of each boundary point. And then uh, we could go one step further. The, the third expansion step, we could look at increasing unions of the things that I just mentioned. So uh, if we were doing just real convexity theory, these various expansion steps would accomplish absolutely nothing. So imagine that we're doing real convexity theory, replace biholomorphic by affine, then these expansion steps accomplish nothing at all. But as we, uh, I think probably everybody knows, uh, listening to this, that uh, it does make a difference in pseudo-convexity theory. And even though you don't need all the expansion steps for every particular example, you do need all the expansion steps here to get, uh, to meet the demands of function theory. Okay, and so uh, one way to say, to describe the collection of pseudo-convex domains is just this collection of, of domains you get by starting with convex open sets and applying these various uh, expansion steps. Okay, uh, so I've just told you how to build pseudo-convex uh, open sets. Uh, there's a question of how, if somebody hands you an open set, how do you test it? And so one of the most useful tests for pseudo-convexity is known as the continuitate zots. And so uh, how does that work? It says, well, if, suppose I have a sequence of holomorphic images of the closed unit disk. Then if I'm working inside a pseudo-convex domain, uh, in the limit, uh, these disks will hit the boundary of omega first along boundaries of the disks. So the situation on the left is perfectly uh, expected. That's what we expect to happen. The situation on the right is uh, not permitted. It's not permitted that we hit the boundary of omega first along interior points of our disks. And it'll be a very important uh, later in the talk uh, that uh, I can also use annuli instead of just disks for this purpose. Just a minute. Okay, then I also want to discuss the notion of the so-called Nebenhull. So in general, uh, working, well, we could be working either in real convexity or pseudo-convexity. The Nebenhull of omega will be defined to be the interior of the intersection of all the convex or pseudo-convex neighborhoods of the closure of omega. So in convexity, in real convexity theory, if you start with a convex open set, the Nebenhull will always just give you back uh, your original set always. Pseudo-convexity uh, theory, well, that often will happen. You'll often get, the Nebenhuller will often be equal to omega, but it certainly can be bigger. So here's a couple of basic examples. Uh, example one, suppose we take the product of the disk with the punctured disk. Then in this case, the Nebenhuller is just the bi-disk, which is strictly larger than omega, but that's not very deep. It just reflects, reflects the fact that omega here is a proper subset of the interior of its closure. So according to some authors, that means that omega here fails to be fat. So, I mean, that's an example, but it's not a very deep example. Uh, we'll go on now to a, a deeper example of the Hartog's triangle. So the Hartog's triangle is just the set of uh, points Z comma W, 
with mod Z less than mod W less than one. So it's a subset of the bi disc. Now, the Hartox triangle itself is actually biholomorphic to the thing I had in example one. But the Nabenhula is not a matter of just intrinsic geometry of omega. It tests what, uh, how omega is sitting inside the ambient space. So uh, you don't, the, the fact that a Hartox triangle is biholomorphic to example one doesn't immediately tell us what's going on with the Nebenhula. But I claim that in fact, uh, the Nebenhula is the bi-disc. Uh, and so I'll discuss a proof of that in a moment. So in this case, we'll say that the Nebenhuller is non-trivial. So non-trivial in this case means that the Nebenhuller contains points that are not in omega closure. So just very briefly, uh, how do we check that the Nebenhuller of the Sartox triangle is the uh, uh, by disk? Well, uh, we can prove that using the continuity dot. So the proof is more or less contained in this picture down here. So I can look at, oops, that's not working very well, is it? Um, oh, just a minute. Yeah, you can imagine taking a family of disks and um, pushing it out uh, along these edges of the Hartox triangle. If we had a, if the neighborhood was trivial, we would have small pseudoconvex neighborhoods of the Hartox triangle. But if I draw a small neighborhood of the Hartox triangle, you can see from the picture that I can push a disk till it hits the boundary uh, of my neighborhood first and an interior point of the disk rather than a boundary point. So by the continuity exhaust, my small neighborhood of H uh, is not pseudoconvex. Let me just pause for a moment. Are there any questions so far? And uh, people will have to unmute themselves to answer a question or to, to make their voice heard. So I, okay. I think you could probably go on. Okay. So I'll go on now to a more subtle example um, of similar phenomenon. So uh, this would be the, the Diedrich Fornes, you could call it the worm model or the pre-worm. Uh, I'll be denoting it by uh, W tilde with a parameter. And so what we have here, well, let's look at the first description. So first of all, I've got the Z2 variable constrained in a certain annulus. And then once Z2 is fixed, then Z1 lies in a certain half plane. So this half plane rotates as uh, mod Z2 changes. So we have like a rotating half plane picture. Uh, so we can take that first description of the pre-worm. We can rewrite it uh, using the magenta uh, inequality there. Now, that second the e equality that's in the magenta there, that involves a multiple-valued function. But that multiple-valued function in the red there, uh, all the various branches of it differ by a positive multiplicative constant. So the inequality is uh, perfectly well determined despite the fact that I'm using a multiple valued function. Then you can take uh, the second line there and rewrite it once more to get the purple inequalities down there. Uh, so it's just a matter of playing around with these uh, standard functions. Uh, I'll mention that at every boundary point of uh, omega tilde, of, of W tilde, uh, that either one or two of the inequalities of these inequalities uh, come into play. And so we, e we have either one or two inequalities on holomorphic functions. So that tells you that locally, the geometry of the boundary here is just the same as the geometry of the boundary of the bi-disc. And then from the discussion of the first slide, that means that this model domain is in fact pseudo-convex. And so following the discussion so far, we now wonder we have a pseudoconvex domain. We wonder if its closure admits small pseudoconvex neighborhoods. So in other words, we're gonna be asking about the Nebenhulla of, the, of this preworm. Well, if we want to expand, it's clear what to do in the Z2 variable. We simply take our annulus and we expand it a little bit. Uh, so that's not very surprising. So 
uh, then we also need to expand in the Z1 direction to get a small pseudoconvex neighborhood of the closure. So here's what we can do. Uh, first of all, uh, so up at this top line here, we had these rotating half planes. You can think in terms of the geometry of the Riemann sphere, you can think of these half planes as being sort of generalized disks with the origin and infinity as boundary points. Well, if I apply a Möbius transformation instead of a family of disks uh, with origin and infinity as boundary points, I'm gonna take the origin and infinity and map that to two, say, finite points in the, in the plane. And instead of a, a rotating family of half planes, what I'll have is a pencil of uh, circles uh, passing through these two fixed points. Uh, and so I get this family of, of, of disks that I've drawn there. And then what I can do, if I want to get a small neighborhood, I simply pick a point in the intersection of all these disks, then everything, uh, all my disks will be star-shaped with respect to that point. So I can just dilate about, I can form dilation centered to that point and just push out and that will give me uh, my small pseudoconvex neighborhood, except there's an obvious catch there. This will work as long as these green disks have a non-empty intersection. It will fail if the intersection of all the green disks is empty. That will happen exactly when these green disks cover the whole Riemann sphere. So that will happen when my parameter gamma is bigger than pi. Okay, so, uh, well, that's too bad. If when the parameter is bigger than pi, then this uh, recipe I gave you for building small pseudoconvex neighborhoods fails, but that still leaves open the question, is there really not a small pseudoconvex neighborhood? Okay, and I'll deal with that in a moment. Uh, so just to prepare for the next slide, I, I went to the... Uh, uh, I got an, uh, heard advice from... Uh, uh, Terry Tao at one point that when you're preparing these slides, you should feel free to copy stuff from the internet. So I just went on a, a homeware site to get a, a spiral staircase. So I just wanted to get a spiral staircase, ignore the railing. What we're gonna think of, think of the very stairs there as being the interior normal vectors along each slice. So what I'm gonna do then is, uh, so again, I've got uh, this rotating half planes uh, so unfortunately, I, I couldn't draw a good three-dimensional picture here, but you should think that the brown areas are the interior normals along each slice. And we'll imagine that I form a very small neighborhood. A I have omega sitting inside a delta neighborhood of uh, the closure of the worm model. And I'm going to show you that that's not going to be pseudoconvex. So um, just a minute. What's going to happen here if I, uh, I'm going to take, so this blue segment there, well, because I'm only recording absolute value of Z2, that blue segment really corresponds to an annulus. So I'll call that the blue annulus A. It's sitting inside the boundary of the worm model, which will in, in turn be, con be contained inside uh, omega. And what I want to do is I want to take that blue annulus and push it a little bit to the right. So I'm going to look at A plus epsilon zero. Well, at the edges of the annulus, I'm pushing into, I'm pushing in the direction of the interior normal slice wise. And so I have plenty of room to maneuver. maneuver. I won't be hitting the boundary of omega anytime soon, but along the middle of the annulus. So being accurate here, it's strictly speaking at what I want is the logarithmic middle of the annulus. So along the, the logarithmic middle of the annulus, I'm pushing uh, not into the worm model, I'm pushing uh, directly out of the worm model. And so since I'm only, since omega is only sitting inside a delta neighborhood of the uh, omega tilde closure, then I'm gonna, I will hit the boundary. And so what's gonna happen here is that if I take the annulus and I push out to the right, as I said, I'm gonna hit the boundary of omega at an interior point of the annulus uh, before I hit the boundary at a boundary point of the annulus. Then the continuitate Zots discussed earlier is gonna show me that this omega is not pseudoconvex. Uh, 
So that tells me that the, there are no small pseudoconvex neighborhoods of the closure of the worm model. And that tells me that the neighborhood, the name and hula of the worm model is non-trivial. Okay, so that's nice, but uh, we would maybe like to improve this example in various ways. So what did I not like about uh, the worm model itself? Well, the worm model was based on these rotating half planes. So in particular, it's certainly not a bounded domain. So uh, well, one way to fix this is to replace each of the half plane slices by a disc slice uh, with the same normal direction with zero as a boundary point. And so if you write this out, you get this defining uh, set of uh, these defining inequalities down here. I'll call this expression here, I'll call that rho. Okay, so now I've got something which will be bounded. I would like to check that it's pseudoconvexity. And now instead of the continuity exotics, it's more convenient uh, to use uh, the calculus way of checking pseudoconvexity. So in general, if I have a, uh, a domain with defining function rho, you can check pseudoconvexity. We'll have, I've written this out for two complex dimensions. You look at the so-called Levy determinant, this three by three determinant here. And so pseudoconvexity is a matter of that, of that uh, I'm sorry, that I should have written uh, determinant in there. I want the determinant of that matrix. So, uh, and so Levy pseudoconvexity is just a matter of that Levy determinant uh, being uh, non-negative. So in our case, the computation shows the levy de determinant is some positive function tom times uh, mod z1 squared. And so we do have pseudoconvexity. Uh, now, what we still don't like is uh, we still have a corner corresponding to the top and the bottom of the annulus. So I don't have a domain with smooth boundary. Uh, oh, let me just back up here. The, in the ma matrix, the subscripts denote derivatives. Okay, so I'd like to do something about the corner here. Well, what we can do is we can keep the spiraling center of the disks, but now instead of, having, instead of having all the disks have the origin as a boundary point, I keep the same spiraling center, but I adjust the radius function. So once, once I get past the edges of the annulus here, the disk will pull in away from the vertical uh, uh, spire and uh, that will enable me to get a, a smooth boundary. Uh, of course, I still have to worry about pseudoconvexity. So the technical condition that you need that was uh, developed by Dieter Conforness was that it's, we're gonna insist that this function R here, that we're gonna insist that R double prime over R prime be large where it's defined. And if we make that uh, restriction, then this Levy determinant will be bigger than some constant times absolute value R prime. And so in particular, uh, our domain will be pseudoconvex. So now we have a pseudoconvex smooth bounded domain. Uh, this is the, the worm of, of Dietrich and Fornes, although these other objects are all also of interest. And then this, this same earlier argument shows that the V worm has a non-trivial Nebenhulla as long as our parameter is uh, big enough. Uh, any questions? Okay, if not, so uh, these worm domains uh, turned out to, well, the original motivation was just what I've described, uh, but these worm domains form a good testing ground for many other problems. And so the one I'm gonna focus on is the topic of this conference, uh, the Bergman projection. So we're gonna look at the Bergman projection on these worm domains. But what we can do is we can um, uh, reverse the, <laughs> the work we've done. So if we start with the smooth worm domain, uh, we can re reconstruct the, worm, the model domains as follows. If we uh, start with the worm domain and we do dilations in the Z1 direction and pass to a limit, we get the worm model W tilde as a limit of dilated copies of the worm itself. And so uh, we get the Bergman projection operator for um, uh, W tilde. I think probably everyone listening knows, but of course the Bergman projection is of course the orthogonal projection from the uh, space of L2 functions on W to the subspace consisting of uh, holomorphic L2 functions. So we get the Bergman projection operator uh, 
for the worm model as at least a weak limit of uh, dilated Bergman projections for the uh, worm domain itself. Uh, so uh, meaning that information about the worm model will give us some uh, information about the worm itself. So let's uh, observe that the worm model has a rotational symmetry with respect to the Z2 variable. So we have an S1 group action here and a uh, dilational symmetry with respect to the Z1 variable. So I can notice I can uh, dilate by um, positive real scalars. By the way, I checked uh, dilational is actually a word, but in most of the uses it seems to be medical, but it is actually a word I checked. So we have uh, an S1 action, we have an R plus action, they commute with each other. We can use Fourier series uh, on, the, on the S1 action to split, in every, to split our projection operator into pieces indexed by an integer k. So for every fixed k, uh, we can use the Fourier transform to represent the kth piece as a Fourier multiplier operator. Now here I should confess, again, uh, our, we had a, an R plus action, a multiplicative R plus action rather than an additive R action. But of course, uh, you can use the exponential function to convert to one to the other. And so strictly speaking, I'm, uh, I'm conjugating the Fourier transform with uh, the exponential function. It gives me something called the Mellon transform, uh, but I didn't want to write out the details on the slide. What's happening is that for each fixed integer K, we get a Fourier multiplier operator. And so uh, we have uh, for each fixed K, we have input data and the Fourier multiplier operator takes that input data and multiplies it by this uh, meromorphic function on the plane. Okay, and so it turns out that the poles of this function are very important. So we can use the residue theorem to do an asymptotic expansion of the output function. Uh, just a general comment, this use of the residue theorem to get asymptotic expansions is very, very well known, is beloved of applied mathematicians. A lot of our favorite pure math textbooks don't actually contain this. And so I just want to put an advertisement in there. When you're teaching such a course, it's good to put this in there. You can get the basic idea of it just by adding one or two homework problems in there. I think this should always be done. Anyway, uh, so you, you we get the input data, we're multiplying by this, uh, this function again. Uh, we do we use the residue theorem to get an asymptotic expansion. So some of the poles come from points when, which are I times integers. Those give rise to integer powers of Z1, which are well-behaved things, we don't worry about them. Then this factor here uh, gives rise to poles at uh, other points and so those give rise to non-integer powers of Z1. And then uh, the asymptotic expansion is gonna show us then that the Bergman projection uh, fails to map test functions to smooth, to, uh, to smooth functions. The output functions are not guaranteed to be smooth. So that's for the, the Bergman projection for the worm model. Um, but uh, then again, sort of undoing all this dilation argument, uh, you can show that the uh, Bergman projection for the worm domain itself uh, fails to map the subgroup of space WS to WS uh, when S is uh, large enough here. So let me just uh, mention that every subgroup of space that will appear in the remainder of this talk is an L2 based subgroup of space. And so uh, we see that uh, the, bigger this parameter is, that's the more winding we have uh, in the thing than the, uh, the lower the threshold for irregularity is. So the situation gets worse uh, when the uh, winding parameter gamma gets bigger. Uh, so uh, in, let me mention just very briefly two important bits of follow-up information. So first of all, Mike Christ, uh, followed up uh, on this work and by showing that the uh, Bergman projection for the smooth worm itself also uh, fails to map C infinity to C infinity. Uh, 
and also there's work of Kranz and Peloso. Uh, so the argument that I gave here just sort of gives you information about, you can transform my argument to say that uh, it gives you information about the bourbon kernel function as one of the two variables approaches the boundary, but there's important work of Kranz and Peloso that gives asymptotics of the uh, kernel function as both variables approach the boundary. And uh, conveniently enough, uh, there will be a talk, I think it's on Saturday, uh, that presumably will give more information about that. So I will, uh, I will defer to that Saturday talk for the moment. So I'm gonna to move to a, a seemingly unrelated problem uh, now. Were there any questions about the, uh, the warm material? Okay, so if not, uh, I'm gonna move on to a problem here that uh, uh, one of our former postdocs in Michigan, uh, Sophia Vasiliadu wanted to work on some years ago, and I started off with something that said nothing to do with everything else I've talked about so far. And it turned out not to be the case, but let's see how this works. So I wanna consider the Bergman projection now on the intersection of two balls in C2. So of course, I'm gonna assume that the intersection is non-trivial. Uh, I can do this with for balls of differing radii, but it'll simplify the discussion if I assume that these are two unit balls. Okay, and so let's discuss the uh, geometry here. So the geometry at first glance, it doesn't have too much to do with the geometry of the worms. But uh, so the, if I look at the intersection of these two balls, uh, the boundary has a corner precisely where the two spheres intersect. The two spheres intersect at something which is topologically a two sphere. Uh, then um, there are well-known topological results from, I guess, the 1980s, which say that if I have a, uh, a two sphere sitting inside C2, it cannot possibly be totally real. And then, well, here we're not dealing with an abstract thing, we are in a specific situation. So direct computation will show that the intersection of the two spheres is totally real, except for exactly two points, what I'll call P1 and P2. Uh, there's no winding involved in, in this picture at all. And uh, again, I motivated the worm by talking about uh, somewhat exotic convexity properties, but here the convexity situation is really excellent. Arguably the intersection of two balls is even more convex than a single ball. Uh, so again, the geometry doesn't seem to have uh, uh, too much in common with the other situation, but it turns out that this problem is a cousin in some respects to the earlier problem. So to get a handle on this situation, we can, we can do is we can apply um, an automorphism of projective space. That's the higher dimensional version of a linear fractional transformation. So uh, just as background, these linear fractional transformations, they're sort of what you're thinking they are, they're quotients of first degree polynomials. But when you have a linear fractional transformation, all the denominators have to be the same. So that gives you an automorphism of projective space. So uh, we're starting with the intersection of two balls. If we apply a linear fractional transformation, we're gonna convert the intersection of two balls to the intersection of two uh, Ziegel half spaces. And so we have uh, this description down here at the bottom. Uh, so when you, when you do this, uh, again, we have these two special points here, which are points where the uh, tangent plane to our sphere is complex. These two points, well, one of them maps to the origin and the other one maps to some point, which is lying off in the, at the uh, line at infinity. Uh, at most points here, uh, so again, we're looking at the corner thing where, where these guys are equal. At most points, uh, well, to, at every point, I'm gonna have two competing normal directions. At most points, those two normal directions are uh, not complex dependent in the sense of complex linear algebra. Uh, 
And so, of course, from a certain point of view, from biomorphic geometry, if I have two vectors in C2, uh, which are not, um, which are C linearly independent, the angle between them has no real biholomorphic significance. But again, at the origin here, and at that other point out at infinity, then the normals in that case are uh, complex dependent. And so the angle between them makes sense. So of course, now the angle between the two normal, uh, the normal directions of the origin, it really is just the same as the angle of intersection for these two spheres, except what I'm arguing to you is that you shouldn't take that angle of intersection very seriously, except at these two special points. So the, uh, at the origin and the companion point in infinity, uh, this angle of intersection is very important in the complex geometry of the picture. Um, so again, the intersection of our two balls has been transformed to this intersection of two Ziegel half spaces. So you look at this description here. Well, once again, we have a rotational symmetry with respect to the, Z, to the W2 variable. So I have an S1 action on, on the intersection. And now instead of a translational symmetry, I've got a, um, I'm sorry, I've got a, a non-isotropic dilational symmetry based on this family of mappings here. Um, but again, I can use Fourier series to deal with the S1 action. Uh, I can, uh, using the exponential functions before, I can convert this sort of multiplicative action to an additive action. And so I can use the Fourier transform as before. So it's again, some version of what's called the, the Mellon transform. And so for every, uh, I get a parameter K as before for every fixed K, I get a Fourier multiplier as before. The multiplier functions, again, are meromorphic functions on the entire plane. And so the exponents and the corresponding asymptotic expansion depend once again on the location of the poles. So let's see, again, all this depends, uh, when you do the Fourier series expansion, you get a, a whole family of pieces indexed by an integer k. For k equals zero, the situation is fairly transparent. Here's our Fourier multiplier for k equals zero. And you see, because the denominator is nice and factored, then the, the poles are at least easy to locate. You just look at where this factor vanishes and where this factor vanishes. Um, but for other values of k, in particular for k equals one here, the situation is not so transparent because uh, I'm looking at the points where that this factor vanishes. So what is this factor? It's a hyperbolic trig function minus a polynomial. And the location of those guys is just not elementary. There's not a clean formula that tells you where the poles are. Fortunately, you can still analyze things. And so uh, with Vasudadu, I was able to uh, prove the following results. So uh, first of all, the exact uh, analytic details here will depend on this angle of intersection, but uh, there's a certain minimum regularity. So the projection for these intersections here will always map test functions into uh, at least the Sobolev space W three half. So again, these are L two Sobolev spaces. So, so three halves is the minimum regularity for this purpose. On the other hand, I don't necessarily get much more than that. So here's the, the story. So if my two balls are more or less the same ball, it's probably not much of a surprise to say that the, the intersection is close to each ball separately. And so I get, uh, it turns out I get good regularity good regularity here up to a very high uh, parameter value. On the other hand, if I'm in a situation like this, where the balls just barely intersect, then again, I'm still mapping test functions uh, to W three halves, but not much better than that. So for every S bigger than three halves, I can make this situation bad enough so the test functions fail to map to W S. So, um, Excuse me, let me get some water here. 
so uh, maybe you're going to get to this, Dave, but I guess I'm yeah. just wondering, like, if there's some kind of an intuition where that three halves is, is coming from. Um, um, I don't have a good intuition for that. That was a surprise to us. We weren't anticipating it. I was going to mention that uh, you can go back to somewhat earlier work. I had a result from uh, uh, 84 and there's also an important result of Bonami and Charpentier from 88. So in general, if you have a star-shaped uh, domain, then uh, the Bergman projection does map W one half to W one half. So uh, again, that doesn't um, doesn't doesn't predict the three halves cut off. But again, uh, there was this earlier work from the 1980s saying that in the star shapes. So, so certainly, these intersections here are star-shaped, and so. Uh, of course, the, the definition of the Berman projection doesn't give you uh, output any better than, than L2 in general, but it, it, it was known from earlier work that uh, you, you could expect at least a, a W1 half estimate. And so again, but Vasilati uh, and I were not able, we did anticipate the three halves cut off in advance. I don't really have a, Okay. Take a good story to explain why that is the case. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so again, the geometry of this the second story with the intersecting balls is very different than the worm geometry. But I want to just sort of sum up here by making a couple comments about common features. So. Again, I, I, when uh, Sophia was asking me to look at this problem, I had no idea that I'd sort of be revisiting the same technology from the worm domain. But uh, let me just make the obvious comments here. In both cases, uh, we looked at automorphisms of our object to set up the use of Fourier methods. In both cases, we find ourselves looking at Fourier multiplier operators where the multiplier was a, a meromorphic function on the complex plane. And then finally, in both cases, even though the geometry looks quite different, uh, there's a way in which the geometry is same because uh, here, the, uh, let me just go back a slide or so, right? The, the angle of intersection I'm talking about is just, is just exactly this parameter theta. And so you see the role of theta down here so theta controls the location of these poles. The poles will determine the regularity results. Uh, and so everything does depend on this angle of intersection uh, the, the, that I was describing earlier. Uh, so uh, that's fine. But there was also an angle controlling what's going on in the, uh, the worm setting here, because what you can do is you can look at the total, Remember, we started off with the worm model with these rotating half planes. So, uh, and a very important angle there is just simply the total amount by which that half plane gets rotated. So I, uh, in setting up the, the talk here, I had rotation taking place at a certain speed, but it turns out you can mess around with the speed of rotation there's various things you can do to this. And it turns out that no matter how you do it, it's the total amount of rotation, which is the, the key parameter here. So again, even though the geometry, the worm geometry is very different from the intersection of balls geometry, uh, there's still an angle parameter, which really governs uh, everything that's going on. And, uh, I guess I'm a little out of practice at getting my timing right, so I'm done just a little earlier than expected, but uh, thanks for listening.